our healer. He is our strengthener. He is our comforter. He is everything that you would ever need, want, hope for, or desire. It's all in Jesus. Amen? So let's just stand and worship him tonight. Hallelujah. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try. 
still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail yeah. your promise still stands great is your the
like we believe. Why don't we worship the Lord like we believe He is the Almighty God? Let's be, let's worship the Lord like He He's never failed us yet. Let's worship Him like He is worthy of our praise, of all of our praise, unashamedly worshiping the Almighty One, regardless of who's around or what we're what they might be seeing. We are worshiping the Lord God, the Almighty, the One who loves us, the One who has redeemed us the one who has given us the robe of righteousness called us his sons and daughters placed his holy spirit on the inside of us given us divine authority in his name the power to overcome demonic forces the, the, the promise that he would never leave us nor forsake oh god we love you lord we worship and praise and magnify you lord if we would go hoarse screaming your name dear god it would be worthy of the praise that belongs unto you Lord God we praise you in spite of the pain the discomfort and the doubt we glorify you father God regardless of of the storms and the oppression that seems to be all about we worship and glorify you and we explode with that dynamic praise that calls upon the most high God to show up in this very day demonstrate your goodness your glory your grace it will only cause us to worship you even more God oh we glorify you God Lord we worship and thank you thank you father God thank you for your promises thank you for your promises in our life thank you for holding on to us father God thank you that you've given us faith that can believe you dear God even when we can't see you at work thank you father god your word is a foundation we can trust and in this day dear god we believe we believe for the holy spirit to stir that word alive afresh on the inside of us lord i thank you that you might give us the same word but somehow it's still a fresh word it's something that we have known but it's that something that there's a new knowing to it a, a new application a new a new step of faith that we can put to practice in our lives so that we can glorify you by being doers of your word in our life so fathers we come together as your church in this moment Lord you're all that matters we're not here just to hear something that we want to hear we're not here just to hear something that makes us feel good we're here to receive the living word of God into our life and may that word make us uncomfortable in areas that need to change May that word comfort us in the areas that we need to just hold on to. But I thank you the word will not return void. It is impossible in this house for the word of the Lord to go forth and to re return void. It will accomplish what it's sent to do. It will prosper in our hearts because we've got hungry hearts. We've got good ground. We're open. We're receptive. Holy Spirit, sow that seed into our lives water that seed in our lives reveal any weed seeds so that we can kick them out of our lives so that our lives are a reflection of your presence and we bear fruit because of your presence in our lives father tonight i thank you for divine divine wisdom lord we we need to see beyond what we can see in this new season we declare that we are in this new season of grace that, Father, we're expecting you to, to manifest yourself. Help us to see beyond what our eyes can see. We thank you, Father, for divine manifestations because of your presence. And then empowering us to do the ministry that you've called us to do. Thank you. We'll run the race. Lord, if there's any weights that are pulling us down right now, I thank you that the Holy Spirit is revealing them to us and breaking them off of us as we are casting them off. Lord, so we can follow after you. Any weights, anything in our life that's holding us back, slowing us down, I think you're exposing them to us so that we can run the race you've set before us. Father, we pray for those in this room. We pray one for another. We pray, Father God, for restoration in people's lives. We pray what the enemy has meant for evil gets turned around for good. We, we pray for every attack that the enemy has put upon us gets turned around for a testimony of God's supremacy in their lives. Every time the enemy has attacked, we, dear God, are expecting a supernatural testimony of the greatness of God. Every attempt the enemy has to contain us, chain us, or bring us down is just another testimony of liberation of your greatness in Jesus name 
I thank you, Father, that you have not chosen just the wise or, or the wealthy or those of great honor, but you've chosen us in this day to demonstrate your grace and your power. And so we humbly come in your presence and say, thank you, God. Lord, we know we're not good enough. We know we're not that, where there's not enough of us. But with you, Father, there's more than enough to be able to accomplish what needs to be done for your glory. And so, Father, we're just asking for the sovereign God to move. We're asking for the sovereign God to move in this church amongst willing people, regardless of what the enemy has tried to do to stop this move in Jesus name amen amen turn to someone and tell them I don't care what he did it ain't enough I don't care what he did the devil did it ain't enough no matter what the devil's tried to do and you know the devil's plans have been building anybody here can testify that the devil's plans have been strategic and have been building in your life and trying to contain us and they I, he doesn't know everything, but he's consensed in that spiritual realm. When God's about to do something, he is, tries to be proactive to derail us before we get to what God wants to manifest through his church. But we're going we're gonna to stay on track. Amen? We're going to stay on track, and we're going to follow after his plan. And, uh, and we are going to be speaking his word and his will. Here's something that we're not going to do. No more complaining and no more blaming. No more complaining and no more blaming. I'm going to say it again because I didn't get enough amens out of that. No more complaining and no more blaming. We are going to go forward. There's nothing the devil can do to stop us. And we will continue to pursue the plan and the will of God in this day and this hour. And we will see the power of God. Amen? I said we will. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Uh, because the Word says so. And I'm just going to be determined to follow after the word and to be a doer of the word. And just like I know you are, a doer of the word. And the title of my message tonight is simply this, nothing's going to change until you change it. Mm, got an mmm, but I didn't get an amen. I got an mmm on that one. Nothing's going to change until you change it. Until you change it. Until you change it. We are in a culture that wants someone else to do everything for us, to make things better, and then we look to either the blame or the complain along the way. But the fact is that we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are still the victorious body of Christ. We are still here on this earth. Jesus is still Lord. Uh, Father God is still sitting on the throne, and it is His still will for us to have heaven's will done here on this earth. We still have the privilege of prayer not for something to go and whine and do, but something to be able to engage with heaven on what he wants to accomplish on this earth. But the fact is it comes down to, in many areas, folks, nothing's going to change until you change it. The personal responsibility that we have and the great privilege we have. Years ago in the, uh, in the uh, uh, mental health institutes, uh, my, my grandmother worked in the mental health institute in in Mount Pleasant, and it was um, quite a facility in, in its day, but years ago in the mental health institutes, one of the uh, simple tests that they would give people, not the only one, but one of the simple ones that they would do to see whether people were able to deal with real life problems. Anybody got real life problems here? Got real life problems. To deal with real life problems, real life problems, was they would take him to a janitor's closet where there'd be one of those large sinks. They would plug up the sink, they would turn on the water. The water would start to overflow. They would give them a mop and a bucket. They'd give them a mop and a bucket and they would say, clean up the mess. They would leave them alone for a few moments and then a little bit later, one of the staff would come back and they would observe how were they cleaning up the mess. If they had not turned off the faucet and hold open the drain but were trying to mop up the water they realized they're not ready for real life problems and being alone sometimes Christians we want God to mop up the mess but we got to turn off the faucets and we got to open the drain to get things going the right direction 
and we find out there's not near as much mess that we want God to clean up in our life. Nothing is going to change until we change it. And we have to have a spiritual capacity to understand how to fix the cause of the problem, not just the results of the problem. Turn to your neighbor and just say, he's talking to you right now. you got to know how to deal with the cause of the problem, not just the results. So many times we're just trying to clean up the mess instead of fixing the source of the problems. I'm not trying to oversimplify this, but just may I say, the devil is the source of the problems in our life. And we have to deal with the source and not just try to counsel the mess or try to medicate the mess or try to hide the mess. So for us tonight, I simply want us to look at a few verses and dive into it. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't until I got really into this message that I realized it connected well with last week's message on who's taking up space in your place and and tonight when we're looking at this we'll go a little bit more into even that demonic influence I think the Lord's reminding us something we have an evil an evil opponent and we wonder why the churches are going empty and why that there is a lack of spiritual hunger it's a strategic plan of the enemy to be to to cause a mess that people are trying to clean up and not dealing with the source that is behind it and so there's some changes that need to go need to be going on to before we're going to clean up the mess in our minds anybody got some stuff there that needs to be cleaned up along the way there there's a mess in some of our homes that we need to clean up along the way there's some messes in the church as a whole not not Grandview we're mess free thank you Jesus here but but as a whole and I don't know if you know it or not but our country is in a mess and we need to know how to not just clean up the mess but we got to go back to the source of that mess darkness darkness only dominates when there is an absence of light Jesus still is the light of the world and he still needs us to be the ones that he shines through his people for his light to go through you don't need to look it up but in Ephesians 5 8 the New Living Bible it says it this way for once you were all full of darkness once you folks were all full of darkness you are a bunch of evil demonic p- people but thank God for Jesus in our life amen Paul said once you were full of darkness but now but now but now you have light from the Lord in your life it's not just my little light it's not just a light it is light from the Lord that spiritual light has come alive on the inside of us so live as people of light this verse is both informative and instructive this verse tells you you are light you don't you don't feel light light is not something you feel light is something that is seen something that penetrates something that goes forth but he's saying here you are light whether you feel like it or not you are light whether you believe it or not if you are a Christ follower his light has come into you and the moment his light comes in darkness is chased out of you at that time and there, it doesn't matter he said you were full of darkness he didn't say you had some he didn't say there was some he said you were full of darkness but the moment light came into you the darkness could not withstand it the w- darkness could not hold it back the light came into us but it's not just getting the light in us it's now live live as people of light live like you got the light in you live differently than the world is around you. wherever you go you chase out darkness isn't that exciting wherever you go there's no amount of darkness that can snuff out the light that's in our life so we need to understand this if we're going to go forward if we're going to make some changes it's not just for us doing some things but first of all it's understanding who we are in Christ Jesus 
We are his light everywhere we go. I'll be honest with you, some mornings I don't, when I wake up, I don't feel a Jesus all over me. There's some days at the end of the day, I don't feel Jesus all over me. There's some times that I feel like I'm defeated or, or struggling or, or don't know what's going to happen. And yet I got to stop and pause and say, but that doesn't change the fact. I am light at this time. And that is just the darkness trying to out to convince me that the mess needs to be cleaned up instead of just shutting off the source and opening a way for it to be relieved in my life. And so when I go and get alone with the, the one who intensifies the light in my life, that's how things start to change. You are light. That's who you are. Well, Pastor, I just don't know if I'm making a difference. Pastor, I just don't know if, I'm, if my family's going to you know, make it. I just don't know if anybody at work even knows I'm a Christian. Well, turn up the light. Turn up the light. We can't make them change, but if we're going to make a change, we've got to be a part of it in our life. We, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to understand there is still a work that needs to be done, and too many people, too many, please forgive me if I'm on a soapbox, too many people are looking for a convenient time to attend church and are not willing to be the church when it comes to confrontational times in our daily life. And we're not just trying to fill up the church with people sitting in chairs. We are trying to transform this world by people that are saying, I am light and I will confront darkness wherever I find it. I will, I will make it difficult for darkness to stick around when light shows up. I'm not just looking for a convenient church service to go to. I am going to be the church. I'm going to be light like my Jesus, and I'm going to go out into that dark world, and I'm going to let people see at least there is a different place. There is a difference that can be made. People in our world right now, the darkness has become so great that they are falling over themselves in their confusion. The chaos that is in the world around us. But light always challenges darkness. Good always overcomes evil. God's kingdom always overcomes the kingdoms of this world. And we are part of what God is calling us today to be. And that is the church, the triumph, victorious, glorious, light-bearing church of the Lord Jesus Christ in this day. Sometimes, sometimes we just got to get in the source's face, Satan. Sometimes we just need to face those demonic forces and get rid of, you don't turn the water faucet off without touching it. And sometimes you got to put your hands on that source and say things are going to change right now. Sometimes we just need to get face to face with those obstacles and we just need to say, I'm not leaving and you don't want to be here when God's going to do what he's about to do. We need to have a confidence that starts to get on the inside of us that we start to talk about what our God's going to do even before he does it. We've done it in the past with the devil. We've done it in the past with problems. We've done it in the past with situations. Why don't we start to turn it around and just simply say, I know that God's going to do something incredible and amazing here. And demonic forces, you don't want to be here when he's about to do what I know he's going to do. This light is going to be intensified, and I'm going to be a part of it. Matthew 16, 18, the Living Translation, or excuse me, the Young's uh, Literal Translation. I'm getting somewhere. Stick with me. Get excited if you want to. It's okay. It's Wednesday night, I know, but it's cool in here compared to roughing out there, all right? Here in Matthew 16, 18, these famous words of Jesus, he said, I will build my assembly. We've taken it into the English translation and we've said church. We'll look at it in just a moment. But he says, I will build my assembly and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It reveal, reveals to us several things here. We can pull this apart. We could preach all night on this. This is the law first. This is the first time Jesus calls the ecclesia, the church, the assembly. This is the first time he refers to us as his church, I will build my church. There is a, a divine orientation or a divine source of the plan of where this is coming from. It's not a group of men that get together to form a council. He said, I will build my, my church, my assembly. It, he, in, in the reference here, he, it's, it's where he's taking uh, 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 the individuals together and putting together as a whole. I will build my, I will call them out. 
I will build this assembly. They will become one. There's a, a sense of unifying in purpose. Their purpose is not their self-existence. I'll say it this way. The problem with government is when it becomes its purpose, its own purpose, instead of serving the people. And he's saying that the, the, the church are coming together. It's not for ourselves. It's for his purpose. It is for his purpose. We're blessed along the way. We benefit along the way, but we're always blessed most when we're fulfilling his purpose along. He said, and the gates of hell will not prevail. There's going to be conflict. He's not talking about people against people. He's talking about kingdom against kingdom. He's talking about his called out ones and the spiritual forces of darkness. There's going to be conflict. There should be conflict. We should be having conflict with the enemy. We should be having conflict with darkness on a regular basis in our life. We shouldn't be. What's the old illustration we've used for years? Any old dead carp can float down the river. But folks, if you're going to go upstream, you're going to have constant resistance. And if you're looking for an easy Christian life, then dead carp your name will be. But if you're going to follow after Jesus, resistance is going to be a part of it. But that just makes you stronger. That just gets you going where you want to go, not where just stuff that's floating downstream goes. He said, I will build my church. And you're a part of that church. You're a part of that assembly. Jesus has called you out, not just to go to heaven when you die, but he says, I've got something for you to do here. There's some things I want to change on earth. And I've got a group of people that I have called out to do my work. And that work that needs to be done is spiritual in nature predominantly. That's the the where we have to to go back to the original source to deal with things. It's just that I will build my church, my assembly, this ecclesia, this 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 group that he's gonna pull together. It's a it, it was referring to actually it was a very common word of the time, but this is the first time Jesus uses it. And it was a legislative group. It was a group that were called together to legislate in their culture. We have it in our government, the legislative branch. Jesus is saying, I'm taking this word that you're very aware of, that a group of individuals are brought together and are given a group of laws, and those group of laws are enforced then upon the people that you represent in your, in your country. He's saying, I'm taking a group of people and I'm spiritually giving them a set of laws. It's called the B-I-B-L-E. I'm giving you the word of God and then I want you to take this word and then I want you to legislate according to it. I want you to use this word, excuse me, to be able to say what is right and what is wrong. And if the church doesn't legislate in a spiritual realm, we will have little or no influence in the cultural realm. We've, we've tried cleaning up the mess, folks. All, and some of us have been good moppers. I'm telling you, you have been good moppers. But unless we take authority over the source, we will not stop the mess from reoccurring and reoccurring. So we, the church, need to have a divine awakening We need to have a spiritual understanding, the the authority that we have because Jesus set it up this way, and that we start to take that authority over the kingdom of darkness and its influence in 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 our lives, in our bodies, in our minds, in our homes, in our communities. It seems that the church has got a glimpse of what it is to come together and worship. Isn't it wonderful when we come together and worship? It, the church has got a glimpse of when we come together in fellowship. We love to come together in fellowship. The church has got a glimpse of what it is to, to, to come together and, 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 and to even maybe to pray together. We, we see that. We've got a, a glimpse of coming together and building something together. But really, for the most part, the church has not got the revelation of coming together to legislate spiritually. I'm not talking about getting out to vote. You need to vote. Please don't misunderstand me. Get out there and vote. Get out there and vote. I believe you should vote. You should go after it. 
Our president said, dear God, get out there and vote. I said, well, we get out there and vote. We're going to vote all right. But we're just constantly cleaning up the mess. We need to get out there and legislate spiritually with divine authority and stand against demonic forces and declare this nation, America, shall be saved. We need to, to pray one more revival in this nation. One more revival that, that God moves, that, that, that it can't be contained, that, that light is going in every direction and it can't be held back. That, that one more time, that it's not a, a denomination or a particular individual that's able to do it, but, but there's just a move of God that goes across this nation. One more time, that darkness will not be able to stop it, and we close that faucet off from that source. We squeeze it shut for a time and a season. We pop that drain and we allow that to go. And we say, in Jesus' name, we are going to see a move of God and we are going to be a part of it. We aren't going to do more than just change people in particular offices. We're going to change hearts. We're going to change lives. We're going to have testimonies that are beyond, beyond uh, uh, denial along the way. That we as the assembly of the Lord Jesus Christ in this day, in this day, are going to be a place and a people that are going to transform and change a culture. Could we do that? Not in and of ourself, but we're not doing this by our numbers. We're doing it by our spiritual authority that has been delegated to us by Jesus himself for his church to do here on this earth. It's not about how many of us there are. The question is, are we in unity? And are we willing to do what he has told us to do? The ecclesia, the spiritual legislative assembly today needs to understand we are here to, to let heaven's will be done on earth. We are here to draw lines and borders and say, Satan, in Jesus' name, you no longer own this territory. You no longer have the right here. We are here not just to fight against bad laws. We are here to legislate over demonic influences and say, demons, you can be here, but you can't be in control any longer. I'm not going to yield to you. I'm not going to be demon-possessed nor demon-influenced. I'm going to be divinely inspired by God and do his will in this day and in this hour. The church, we need to regain our spiritual authority. Do what God has called us to do. Ruling with that authority. Taking it, that spiritual authority that we, we have. And if we don't, if we don't take our place spiritually, if we don't take our place spiritually, the results will be catastrophic. There will be no restraint against the kingdom of darkness. It don't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter who's their governor. If the enemy is not restrained spiritually, those natural forms of government will have little result. But thank God we're here not to necessarily just put people in places politically speaking, but we are here to make sure thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven along the way. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. As we're moving forward, it seems in our day that things have gotten so out of control. The Word of God has lost its influence in many churches where the spirit of tolerance has moved in. Sin has been redefined as just a struggle that you have individually that oftentimes is medicated or just struggled or counseled so that you can learn to live with it. Life is being devalued to the demands of convenience of my body. We see that marriage has been redefined by 2% of our population. The pulpit, if we do preach the gospel, oftentimes is accused of hate crimes because we preach the truth of God's word. People are no longer afraid of walking just the streets of South side of Chicago, but the malls and the school halls of our nation. I think the mess has just gotten out of control, folks. And mopping it up isn't going to help if we don't go back to the source. And we're not going to go back to the source unless you and I understand the spiritual authority that we have individually, 
but there is an understanding that it comes together when we are corporate. He said, I will assemble my church. There's an assembly that goes on. There is a unifying force where two or three are gathered together in my name. In the book of Acts, when they were all in unity in one accord, there's many things that happened. So when we come together, we understand that we are here for the purpose of transforming this world, liberating people, and pushing back the kingdom of darkness. Let's just be honest. We're in Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at this in just a moment. Let's be honest. Too many Christians are still focused on me instead of on what God wants to do in this earth through me. We are focused on our convenience, our comfort. We're focused on what's it going to cost me instead of no cost is too high for me. I was just having a conversation with an individual in my office today. We were talking about, well, what about people that say, you know, well, I'm lukewarm, but God's not just going to throw me out, you know, and when, you know, why would God do that if, you know, uh, I'm just, you know, would he just kick me out? Because that, I said, my question is, why are you lukewarm? If you knew Jesus saved you, if you knew Jesus died for you, if you knew that God Almighty loved you so much that he sent his son for you, why in the world would you be lukewarm? Who wants to be in a lukewarm relationship? You know, I, I, I just imagine Marilyn would have just uh, had another answer for me if I would have said, honey, I want you to be my wife, but, uh, but let's just keep it lukewarm. Let's just keep it lukewarm if you went around. No. Every relationship should be with the intent of going to a greater level along the way. And we should, wherever you're at, wherever you're at, and I know some of you are, are just almost close to Jesus in your walk. I know you're almost there. But there's another level that we need to be pushing into and in understanding and growing in, in God's grace. We need to be ready to defy the enemy. We need to be ready to defy human logic, even our personal feelings along the way. Because we are here not to comply with the world, but to comply with the word of God. We are in compliance with his word, his will, and his purpose. And in that, we're going to have to confront demonic forces. Let me ask you real quickly before we start reading here. We've got just a few minutes. When was the last time you had to deal with a demon? Most of us would pause and say, ah, uh, I don't know. Do you think there's a lack of them? A lack of awareness of them in our life. A lack of awareness of them. Partly, could it be a lack that we are a threat to them? A threat. No threat. We're going to change that. I'm not looking for demons. I'm just saying if they're part of the source that's causing the mess, then let's be wise enough to deal with the source. If Jesus dealt with demons and he said, go do what I have done, then we should somewhere along the way have to do what he did along the way. And I would rather have us have good, strong, biblical understanding and awareness so when we have to deal with that, that demonic force, we will be pre prepared and we will overcome. And it won't be just for you. It will be so that others will be blessed too. Listen to this. Jesus demonstrates his spiritual le legislative authority on this earth that he wanted to demonstrate to his followers here in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. And verses 1 through 17 is, folks, T.D. Jakes used to say, new levels, new devils. New levels, new devils. And as we go forward, we need to understand we'll have new opposition, but we have the same authority as we go forward. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 1 through 17. And, and then they came into the other side of the sea in the country of the Gadareans. And when he had come out of the boat, Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, demon-possessed individual. Verse 3. Who had, uh, uh, who had his dwelling among the tombs. He, he lived in the cemetery and uh, the de amongst the dead. And, and no one could bind him. Listen to this. He, even when, with, with chains, because he would, would often would just 
break them, or if he was bound with shackles and chains, the chains had been pulled apart by him, and his shackles were broken to pieces, and neither could anyone tame him. For, stop here for just a moment. Uh, they're trying their best, folks. Uh, they're, they're trying to contain the individual so he doesn't keep hurting himself. They, they're trying to contain him because he's causing a ruckus and, and, and causing a, a, a bad rep, a reputation for that community around about there. Uh, they're trying to stop him. They're doing the best they can. They're, they're putting chains on him and they're putting shackles on him. The best that they had to offer at the time. But he had a demonic strength about him that he would be able to break those chains and he would just shatter those shackles that they would put upon him. The, the strength was uncontainable and no one could tame him. They'd talk nice to him. They would threaten him. They would counsel him. They would do all kinds of things. But this man was a mess. He was uncontainable by the, he- the, the efforts of the individuals at the time. And because of it, he was influencing that area. The stories about him, everybody knew. If you had to go from here onto the other side of the cemetery, you went a long way around so that you didn't run into that dude because you didn't want to see that or experience that. But not only this, it goes on here in verse 5, and always... Night and day, I tell you, demons, they don't, they don't sleep either, and they don't want you to sleep. They torment you. You got something that won't let you sleep at night, you need to turn that faucet off. You got something that is constantly tormenting you, that won't allow you to rest, that causing you to be just nervous and fidgety, and, and, and won't let you sleep at, at night, and won't let you enjoy the day. Uh, it's, a, it's a faucet that needs to be turned off in your life. Nothing's going to change till you change it. You can take enough pills to make you sleep, but when you wake up, it's still going to be there, and you're going to have some wild dreams along the way. It's better just to turn that faucet off. Day and night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones, mutilating himself, self-inflicted wounds and pain. And we see even in our day how many people are are self-inflicting wounds in their lives driven by something, whether it's oppression or possession, but they're driven along the way. Here we have this man, pitiful sense of a human. No one wanted to be around him. Here we go on to verse 6, and when he saw Jesus, this is where, where for, for most church folks, most Sunday morning church folks, this is where it gets really strange. And when he saw Jesus, he ran and worshiped him. I mean, can you, can you just picture this for a moment? Jesus is walking along with his disciples who have become accustomed to him, and so it's no big deal to be with Jesus. Jesus comes over to a new territory where the individuals are strangers. They don't know Jesus, so they're trying to size him up whether they want to have anything to do with this man or not, and who is he? And in the midst of all of this, we've got this crazy guy from the tombs that nobody can handle, who's been demon-possessed for, for who knows how long. His body, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody who's demon-possessed, who sleeps in their own urine, who's, whose wounds are oozing out with, with a pus and, and fresh cuts upon him and, 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 and that wild look that's in his eyes that, and, 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 and it comes, he's, he's undernourished and, and, and you can just see the effects of that demonic force in his life and he comes up and there's like, oh no, there's that crazy guy again and what does he do? He comes, this man with, we'll find a thousand demons comes and falls at the feet of Jesus in surrender and worships him. We've got, we've got Sadducees and wooden seas that know thousands of scriptures that wouldn't bow a knee to Jesus. But this one who had a thousand demons comes and says, I must surrender willingly to your legislative authority in the spiritual realm because I know who you are. Isn't it incredible? We didn't, you didn't ask, is it okay to bow down in the front of the church during, during singing time? Is that, is that okay? You didn't, we didn't know whether it would be inappropriate to raise his hands. I, I remember talking with somebody who had visited another church, and they didn't know if it was acceptable to raise your hand. It would be too much, you know, kind of out, of out of character or out of comfort. Folks, if you can't go to a church where you can unashamedly surrender to the lordship of Jesus at least as much as this demon did, 
then we need to change something in our church. I'm not saying that every time you gotta be on the carpet, but I'm saying I think there should be some more times that we have a fresh revelation of who Jesus is and his legislative authority over our lives and that we just willingly say, I surrender all. I, I recognize your authority. Nothing else is going on that can stop. It just, it just amazes me. He ran and worshipped him. And when he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do to you with Jesus, our son of the most high God? He knew exactly who he was. I implore you, you by God, that you, you do not torment me. Verse 8 goes on. He said, he said to them, come out of him, you unclean spirit. And then he said, what is your name? May I pause right here. Don't get on a sidetrack. Don't go around trying to pick up everybody, every demon's name or even angel's names. You don't need to know their names. This is a very unique situation. Most of us will never have to go into this situation. But Jesus, again, as he was dealing with him, he wasn't trying to find out his name out of a sense of curiosity, but it was a sense of authority. My name is still above your name. And, in the, and I know that people trying to get names of angels and names of demons. I tell you what, just know Jesus and you'll be okay. Stick with that one. Stick with that one, okay? Just know that one and you'll be fine as you're going along. But Jesus here, he speaks to him. He says, my name is Legions. Legion, he didn't say, my name is Chaotic Mob, did he? He didn't say, my name is, 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 a, is a rebellious group of, of teenagers. No, he said, my name is Legion. We are well organized. We march in unity. We have a purpose. We have a leader. We're set up in in categories and, and strategic purposes here. My name is Legion. I've got this organized. And what I'm doing here, not only what I'm doing in this man, listen to me, and I, I know we're, we're running out of time. Not only what I'm doing in this man, Legion says, I know what I'm doing in this community. Because of what I'm doing in this man, I'm terrorizing this community. I'm influencing this city. They see my authority, my power, when I break those chains, when they try to tame me, when they try to contain me. I'm having influence. I am strategically keeping the faucet turned on full. But Jesus shows up. Jesus is there, and he says in verse, and at verse 10, it goes on, it says, and he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of that country uh, the more literal translation in the Greek would be out of that space or out of that territory. He didn't care so much about the man. He wanted to be in that place of territory, of influence that he had there. And how'd that influence come? It was through the man. And so we see in our lives, folks, as we go forward, and you see people that are doing demonic things. You see people that are, that are doing terrifying things. You see people that are causing terror or causing influence by their evil influence, whether it's the guns that they carry or by the influence that they have, I want you to stop and say, don't get so upset with the person, go to the faucet. Go to the source and start to take authority over the source. Of the, this poor man was driven. This poor man was tormented. This poor man did not have the ability to change his behavior because of the influence of that spiritual force that was in his life. But Jesus shows up, and we know the story goes on here. Verse 11, and when a large herd of swine was feeding there nearby in the mountain, uh, so all the demons begged him, saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. And at, at once, Jesus gave them permission. And they, when people say, well, why didn't Jesus send them to hell? Jesus did not have the authority to send them to hell. Demons' forces have the permission right now to be on this earth. Whole nother series, whole nother sermon. You're not going to send people, demons to hell, but you can contain their influence here on this earth. They can be here. They just need to be contained along the way. We just need to shorten the chain on their life. And it goes on, it says, and, and, and at once Jesus gave them permission, and the whole unclean spirit 
uh, ran out and entered the swine. There was about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Can you imagine for just a moment the torment that that one individual had been going through? To have the strategic uh, plan of the demonic forces that were so oppressive, so chaotic, so tormenting within him that when they went into this herd of swine, the swine went out of their, their logic, we could say, went out of there and drowned themselves because of the torment. And yet this one man had all of that going on on the inside. Had a mess he couldn't clean up and he needed someone to come and help him. Change. Verse 14, and so, so, so there, the, those who, who fed the swine and, uh, went and told the city, the country, and they came out to see what had happened. And they came out to, to Jesus and, and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting clothed and in his right mind. I'm not against counseling. I'm not against medication. I'm just telling you, you can't counsel demons out of people. You can't medicate demons out of people. You got to cast demons out of people. And when demons come out of people, there's an immediate transformation that goes on in that situation, in that person. Not only, as we said last week, they, the demon needed to leave, but then the, the individual needed to be filled. Remember last week? They needed to be filled. He's at the feet of Jesus being taught at this very moment. He was at the feet of Jesus. The city folks came out. Now, I, I'm a country boy. I, I grew up on the farm, folks. This time of the year when I was growing up, we didn't know if our shoes fit or not because we usually weren't wearing shoes because we were running the, 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 the cow trails and, and playing in the pond and we were out there. But these city folks, they came from the city out to the country. Out to the country. Where had this man been? Out in the cemetery amongst the dead in a place that well-dignified individuals wouldn't go on a good day alone when they knew that demon man used to have hang out in that spot, and the city folk even came out to see what was going on. I implore you, every demon attack should turn around to a testimony and an attraction to who Jesus is in this day, and it only happens when we understand we have the legislative authority as the body of Christ, the, the called out ones in this day to be able to do what needs to be done. To be able to say, in this territory, Jesus is going to rule and to reign through his church. The demonic forces no longer have the right to be here. They no longer have the right. That demonic man, when he came, he came, he came with, 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 with can you imagine the sight of that man? I don't, like I said, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody with the smell of where they've been they're just sleeping in their own urine and, 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 and the sores and the pus and the flies that would have been coming out, the, the haunting stories that everybody would have been talking about this gentleman and the presence of that demonic force. You've been around demons, man. Your hair on the back of your head just starts to stand up and that, 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 that intimidating presence is there. And yet in the midst of that, Jesus legislated spiritual authority set the man free, and he pushed back the influence of that demonic force in that territory. So as I wrap up here in the last minute that we have, what faucet in your life needs to be turned off? What, what's, what source of demonic influence in your life needs to be stopped? Nothing's going to change until you change it. Jesus has given us the authority, given us his word, given us his will. He, we, we, we've got demonic conflict that we've got to deal with. Let's deal with it. Let's deal with it. Let's deal with it. You've got to get your, your house in order. You've got to get your life in order. We've got to make sure that we're just reminding the adversary in this church, in this community, that he has no authority. We're pushing back. We're taking new territory for the kingdom of God along the way. But it's something that we've got to do together. You can't just rely upon pastor to pray. You can't rely just upon Monday prayer group to pray. You've got to be individuals that not only pray, but you take authority. Jesus didn't pray about this situation. He cast it out. He didn't pause and say, Father, if it's your will, he cast it out. And he cast back that influence. Three things as we leave. Just write these down if you're writing notes, please, quickly. There is something that we do need to pray. There's three things I want you to pray for us as a congregation, specifically for you as an individual. I want us to pray for revelation 
of spiritual authority that we have. We need to understand the authority that we have as the body of Christ. That we don't get sucked into just a political position. We don't get sucked into just a numerical equation that if we can just get enough people. But that we understand as the latest legislative authority, the body of Christ, his ecclesia, that we have spiritual authority on this earth. A revelation of that. Ephesians chapter 1, that prayer that Paul prayed there, that we would be filled with that wisdom and that understanding and that power. A second thing, I want us to pray for discernment when it comes to dealing with spiritual forces. Discernment where it comes to dealing with spiritual forces. And I remember I, as a kid with different books, I read different books than maybe some people read today. I don't know if people even read books today. But remember the old story of the tar baby? Anybody remember that story? Where, where the, 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 and the, the rabbit was confused on what the real enemy was. And the more he would, would punch, it would get stuck to that tar baby. The wrong enemy. We got to know where we are and what our, where our fight is. And we need spiritual discernment. Slash, we need the gift of discerning of spirits in operation. The gift of discerning of spirits is a grace gift that God has given to the church. And the reason for that church, uh, that gift, is to help us to legislate authority. That's not just where it comes to demons, but we also see what God's doing. So that we can resist some things and we can advance some things. And so uh, more gifts, uh, the discerning of spirits in operation. We can understand and see that the, how to turn the faucet off. And the third and final thing is, it, it would be this, that we would have calm courage to face the intimidations that are going to come. The enemy is going to try to intimidate us. The enemy is going to come to try to deceive us. The enemy is going to come and hope we are ignorant of our spiritual authority. But if we will pray for revelation, if we will ask for discernment, and if we will then be ready with calm courage to stand against the enemy, then we will take territory for the kingdom of God. Instead, of, we've just lost too much territory, folks. We've lost it in our schools, we've lost it in our churches, lost it in our home, lost it in our nation. But we, but, but we haven't lost hope because we still got God. And we can take that territory back in Jesus' name. But nothing's going to change unless you change it. Heavenly Father, right now, we dedicate ourselves afresh to you. Lord, may we at least have the, the wisdom, the understanding of, that, of those demons, that you are the almighty God. That we willingly surrender our life to you. And if there's any areas that we have become self-serving, that you will expose them to us so that we might ask for forgiveness and repent and change. Lord, I thank you that you are preparing this church not just to welcome new people, but to launch out into our community, to take territory from the kingdom of darkness, to be light wherever we are, to be liberators wherever we are, and to be ready to confront any intimidation that the enemy would throw our way. So Lord, I thank you for this church. Thank you that you have called us out so that you can send us out so that we can do your will during this day. Holy Spirit, right now, I ask for a seal. I ask for the Holy Spirit to seal these things. That, that the enemy will not be able to just snatch them. That the, the significance of this, it's not just a good sermon. It's not just a familiar story. It's our, it is a vision for the future. Of seeing people liberated and set free. It's a vision of the future. Of territory being captured for the kingdom of God. And influence of the adversary being broken over communities. Our children aren't afraid to go to school. The families aren't afraid to go to the mall. We're not afraid to walk down the street. But we are light wherever we go. And we'll demonstrate your grace. And we'll liberate others along the way. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pray this out. Walk it out. And we're going to see lives touched and changed. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for taking the, uh, the, being, the inconvenience of being here on a Wednesday night. Uh, I, I greatly appreciate it and believe that God is stirring things in us for what he's going to do through us. God bless you. We'll see you bright and early Sunday morning ready to worship God just extravagantly and ministering his grace. God bless you.